Uh, right now, though, very pleased to have with us from the Legal Insurrection blog, uh, Mr. William Jacobson, uh, uh, Professor William Jacobson. Uh, Professor, how you doing, sir? Good. Great to be here. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Good to talk to you again. And I uh, saw your post uh, from uh, yesterday where you have a gun class project going on. And this is fascinating. Uh, you don't have to look at, you know, 18th or 19th century statutes. You can look at uh, fresh legislation just passed piping hot from the uh, legislative process in New York State. And what are you finding in this new law? Well, it's very complicated. I mean, that's the first thing that people need to understand, is that this is a 39-page bill which has all sorts of potential pitfalls for people in terms of um, selling ammunition, for example. Uh, now it can only be done, you know, with a background check. There's no more, essentially no longer any private gun sales that are permitted, so you can't sell a gun, even if it's a legal gun, to a friend. It has to go through a gun dealer. There's just all sorts of ways in this law that uh, otherwise law-abiding people, even people who want to comply with the law, can very easily run afoul in terms of the uh, ban on uh, magazines that hold uh, more than seven bullets. You can't even sell those in New York anymore. And if you've got them you can't that hold ten, you can't even put ten bullets in them. You can only put seven. So uh, there's just all sorts of things here which, you know, I think... I don't know what the intent was, right. but just looking at this, I would say that it's so complicated that it's simply going to scare a lot of otherwise law-abiding people, people who would never use a gun in a crime or do anything wrong with it, from just saying, I can't figure this out. I give up. I'm not going to do it. And I think that's what the net result of this law will be. Yeah, look, I, I think you're right. I mean... We know, you know, I, I, I think we know uh, anyway that uh, part of what's going on here is this um, attempt to to try to get fewer gun owners in this country. Uh, they want to make it more difficult. They know that they can't, because of the Heller and McDonald decisions, they, they can't wipe the Second Amendment uh, off the books unless they try to repeal it. But what they can do is try to make it as difficult as possible legally and culturally to become a gun owner and exercise your Second Amendment rights. That's right. I mean, the standards they have, they've, they've changed the standard for what is defined under the statute as an assault weapon and the characteristics that it, that it has to have. Now, uh, as somebody myself who does not claim any expertise or deep knowledge of weapon terminology, I'm not sure that I could determine that. And, you know, so you have to rely on other people. And I think there are going to be people who run afoul of the law without any intention, who did not realize that the, the rifle they have uh, may fall under that classification. They forget to get it registered because now anything that falls under the classification of an assault weapon has to be separately registered with the state. So they forget to do that because they didn't realize it needed to be registered. And they get stopped one day and you know, uh, they consent to a search of their car, and in the trunk is this rifle they were taking to a shooting range, and all of a sudden they're a felon. And I think that that is really the problem with such a complicated statute, is that it doesn't prevent for a second the people who want to commit a crime from doing it. Right. Because they don't care about the law. Uh, what it does is it scares away people who want to comply with the law but look at it and say, you know what? I can't run the risk, and therefore I won't do it. So I think you're right that this, these sort of things that are so complicated and so onerous is simply a way of scaring people away. Now, um, have you seen anything in this law, uh, a Professor, that, that you think is, uh, or maybe more than one thing in this law, that you think is challengeable in court? Uh, you know, I, I haven't reviewed it for that purpose, so okay. I don't want to say one way or the okay. other. Okay, you've just been actually trying to figure out what's just in it. Just trying to figure it out has been a project in and of itself. And just to show you how complicated the statutory language is, I find myself going back to the legislative summary of things just to try to figure out what it is they're trying to do here. Because if you just actually <laughs> read the law, yeah. you, you can't figure it out. It's very difficult. I mean, I got to look, I got to say the you know, when when Governor Cuomo said, uh, well, there's no way to know, you know, when these magazines were made, we've got to ban the magazines uh, that didn't happen. And that would have been bad enough. Uh, but what did happen, I guess their 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 quote unquote compromise is laughably stupid to say, well, you can keep these magazines, but you can't ever put more than seven rounds in them. 
uh, to, to expect that the crim- I mean, again, we're, they said this is not about the law abiding. They said we're not trying to go after the law abiding. We're trying to go after the criminals. We're trying to go after the people who, who break our laws and who are, you know, committing these violent crimes. So we expect them to pay attention to this? I, I mean, you know, from a, if I were a gun control advocate professor, I'd be embarrassed. I, w- I would say, you know, fellas, we look stupid. We should have just, you know, said we have to, we have to go round up all of the magazines. Well, you know, that, that's, that number seven is such a curious number. I haven't done a 50-state survey, but it's not a, a number you normally hear in this conversation. It's, it's not a number that's normally, I mean, you don't have a lot of magazines that are produced in a seven-round capacity. That's right. And, and that's, again, another way of, of, because if you currently have a lawful 10-round magazine, you can keep it. You just can't put more than seven bullets in it. But there's no new purchases, no new sales of magazines that hold uh, more than seven. So, again, I'm not that familiar with the, the gun industry in terms of manufacturers, but it's my understanding that there really aren't many pistols that are made for a six or seven, you know, uh, bullet magazine. Right, right. And, and you know, another interesting, I, there, there are uh, eight-shot revolvers. Uh, out there, which which is kind of odd now that uh, it is possible. You know, look, if you want more than seven rounds, buy a revolver uh, in New York State, and I guess that would be okay, right? Well, I'd have to go back and look at the <laughs> statute as to how they treat uh, a revolver that holds more than seven rounds. I mean, we're going to get, if, if that is the loophole, um, you know, it just points to the absurdity of it all. Yeah, there are a lot of things pointing to the uh, absurdity of this. Uh, And and as you say, 39 pages, very, very confusing. We know that, for instance, they're already uh, talking about having to go back because they did not exempt law enforcement from the magazine ban uh, and from the new definition of the quote-unquote assault weapon. So uh, we have a lot of cops in New York right now who are breaking the law. That's right, and that just goes to show you. I mean, the other objection a lot of people have is simply to the way it was done. It was rushed through. There was no sunshine on it, so to speak. And, you know, there was nothing that required that it be done in 24 hours or 48 hours. That's, you know, I I don't think that that was necessary. And uh, they probably would have passed something anyway, but I think it would have avoided perhaps inconsistencies like the fact that now all of uh, the police in New York, or many of them, are technically violating the statute. And if it's not going to be enforced as to them, why should it be enforced as to your average citizen? Yeah, so the the, the David Gregory exemption now comes into play, and this is what you wrote about. Uh, Is there a David Gregory clause? Is there Uh, A clause that says, all right, you know what, if you've got a TV show, if you're powerful, if you're connected, if you're if you're one of if you're one of those people, uh, Professor, you're going to be okay. Well, Uh, there's not a clause that says it that way. I I think there's a there's certainly in all of these cases prosecutorial discretion. So they decide who they want to prosecute, who they don't. But there is one clause in there which is very curious and and it comes through in a, a relatively narrow, it doesn't apply to everything, but it applies to uh, magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, essentially 30 round magazines. Those were illegal in New York unless it was manufactured prior to September 1994. So if you had essentially an old 30 round magazine, you could keep it. That now becomes illegal in New York State to keep that. Um, if you, it's a misdemeanor if you keep it, but you can avoid getting prosecuted um, if the, you know, you turn it back into the police. But there's one very curious clause in there which says that it uh, has to be a knowing violation, and it's presumptively knowing if the if law enforcement advises you that it's illegal. And that just struck me as very odd because that appears no place else in the statute. I mean, generally speaking, in criminal law, if you intend to do the act, it doesn't matter whether you know it's illegal or not. You intended to do the act. And so here they have this specific provision that for 30 bullet magazines, the, um, you do have this defense that you can turn it in, and it's, but you are considered to have violated the law for sure, presumptively, if law enforcement tells you it's illegal and you don't turn it in. So it just was very curious because that's the David Gregory situation. He called the D.C. police or someone from his office did. Can we use this in the show? They said no. They used it anyway, but the prosecutor decided not to prosecute. So that was just one thing which I just stumbled upon on there. I wasn't looking for it, which is just one of these real peculiarities in the law. And to expect somebody to understand all these nuances I think is a little much. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Listen, Professor, thank you so much for your time, sir. Great talking to you today, and uh, I look forward to reading more about the discoveries that, uh, that, that you and some of your students are finding in the New York law. Great. Take care.